Welcome to the Tudor Dixon podcast. We talk a lot about bullying in our country. There are endless lessons today in school to prevent bullying, but it's still happening. It's happening to our kids. And sadly, I even see it every day with adults. It's crazy. I see it on social media. I see it at sporting events. Really bullying is all over. And I think it's more accessible now than it ever has been before because we see cyberbullying. And sadly, in some of these cases, bullying leads to the unthinkable. Today, I have Rob and Rose Bronstein with me. They lost their 15-year-old son, Nathan, last year after he struggled through unrelenting cyberbullying. Nathan didn't see a way out other than to take his own life. And their story is an eye-opening look at how often school administrators fail to include parents, particularly when there are these serious issues with life-altering consequences. Coming out of this tragedy, together, Rob and Rose have created Buckets Over Bullying to put an end to cyberbullying in honor of their son, Nathan. Before I bring Rob and Rose on with me, I want to talk to you a little bit about a product I have in my home. It's called EnviroCleanse. And when you think about the air in your house, you should ask yourself if all air home purifiers are the same, why did the U.S. Department of Defense select EnviroCleanse to protect and purify the air on board their Navy ships? We use it in our house because one of my girls suffers from severe seasonal allergies, and honestly, it's changed her life. She had really serious bloody noses, headaches, swollen eyes. Those are all gone. EnviroCleanse uses patented earth mineral technology, plus a hospital-grade HEPA filter. This technology is so powerful, it destroys colds and flus and COVID. Actually, those allergy-inflaming toxins as well, and even more. Their hospital-grade technology is so powerful. Like I said, it's used on Navy ships and in thousands of classrooms. The EnviroCleanse promise is far fewer colds and allergies and better sleep. You will receive a free air quality monitor with your purchase. Honestly, test the difference in your own home. Visit ekpure.com. Use code Dixon for 10% off your EnviroCleanse home air purification unit and free air quality monitor plus fast free shipping. That's $150 savings. That's ekpure.com code Dixon, ekpure.com code Dixon. Now I want to bring in Rob and Rose. Thank you both for joining me today. And I just want to start by saying I am so sorry for your loss. It is really unimaginable for a parent to go through this. And I just can't tell you how grateful I am for you to talk about it so other parents can understand what your situation was and what you went through. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. So I think that I, I want to talk about exactly what happened with Nate because he was 15 years old and this started at a private school in Chicago. And I, I think it's important to know that this can happen at any school. And here is you're paying tuition and you're paying a lot of tuition at this elite private school in Chicago. And they started, what happened is, from what I understand, one of the kids or a group of kids started a rumor that he was unvaccinated, which I find interesting because I think a lot of our kids struggled coming out of COVID. And then there were obviously, we talk about bullying across the spectrum of ages. And we saw a lot of this in the country where adults were going after each other over COVID stuff. And I cannot imagine being a 15 year old and going through this. And the truth was he wasn't even unvaccinated, but that's how this started. Isn't that right? Uh, it was one of many instances in how it started. Uh, when he transferred over to the Latin School of Chicago his sophomore year, we were still in the midst of the pandemic. The reason why we transferred him is because at the time, the Latin School of Chicago had made a formal announcement that in the fall of 2021, they would be eliminating online learning and everybody would be back in school in the classroom. And to Rob and I, that was really important to us. We had had enough, just like many parents across the country, of all of our children being at home uh, doing online learning. So that was the, the precursor as to why we thought it would be advantageous for our son to be at Latin, just to get the in-person learn learning experience. Um, unfortunately, as soon as he did not get onboarded correctly, there was no support system for a transfer student. And as soon as he got there, he just started feeling isolated, excluded, unwelcome. Um, and the kids just started to dig at him. Just it's almost like it's like the it's like death by a thousand cuts, right? So the the bullying started 
while he started just to go to school there. So comments about why why did you transfer? Um, he's he's a uh, he was he's a troubled child. So why you know he must that's why he transferred in uh, his sophomore year. Um, questioning. Um, sorry, I just lost my. Oh, I can I can chime in. No, he he look he he was <clears throat> these schools the school that he was at and Latin school up our long standing rivals going back decades and um it would be unusual for anyone to transfer he actually did very well in his uh in the school that he was at he had a lot of friends and played on sports teams and was very well liked and the reason that we decided to transfer him was due to one thing and one thing alone which is that the leadership of that school was very adamant and confident that they would be back with in-person learning and his former school was not. And for us, that was a bright line. Um, but that was the reason he transferred. It was the only reason. And um, he was not troubled. But 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 I totally echo what, what Rose said, which is that it was unusual for someone to transfer between these two schools. And, you know, teenagers and kids being what they are, their minds are going to start to, you know, cook up whatever it is. They started yeah. those yeah. rumors that there was some reason that you would have had to transfer and put him in that awkward yeah, and situation. I, and and that started it started at, at school. school. So multiply every single day and going to school and being questioned, being interrogated, being looked at in a strange way or he could feel the un- he could feel how uncomfortable it was for him being there and not be how did teachers not see this? I mean, that seems so like to me with a new student, why, how could they have, uh, it seems like the teachers and the administrators failed him that they didn't immediately step in and do something with these other kids. Well, that's one of the biggest problems with bullying today is that when you don't have actual documentation, right? When kids can be sly with, with the way they treat each other, then the adults in the room, they're going to say, well, I don't have any proof. And it becomes a he said, she said, right? So peers and administrators don't believe that ostracizing someone or making them feel uncomfortable is a form of bullying, but it is. It is. And that's how it starts. Another example of this, especially in the online world, and I'm sure you've heard this or seen this before, with kids are on a group text or, um, and they decide to pull somebody out of it kick someone off a text, that's Mm cyberbullying, right? Or if there's a group text of 20 students and they start a new one and leave one out, that's cyberbullying. And that starts to mess with the child's emotional and mental state. That's something that I we talk about a lot on the podcast because I think that this is such new territory for us as parents, especially parents today who have kids in high school and kids that are using devices like this because we didn't ha- I mean I didn't have this when I was growing up. I you know we had the ha- house phone and my mom could pick up on the other end and tell me to get off. You know, nobody was sending private messages to anybody, but we've had that same experience. So last year 8th grade, my daughter was 13 and one of the boys, they had a classroom group text and one of the boys decided to cut her out. Never, she never understood why, but she, you know, it says you've been removed from this group text. And, and just that, I remember just that tiny thing happening in her world was huge. And that's another thing that I think you, you look at these administrators and these teachers and you say, you spend your time with these kids every day. This is not an adult. This is a child. When something like this happens to a kid, it is times 10 what it would be happening for an adult because that's their world. And and one of the things that we try to talk to people about is that at 15, those consequences of the permanency of suicide, the permanency of taking your own life, it, it just doesn't resonate like adults understand it and the the idea that they can get to this point that you can have other kids push to this point but but how did this do the other parents did they not know that this was happening i mean how did how did it get so far without administrators stepping in the crux of the of the tragedy is as follows uh in late december there was a basketball game our son was on the jv basketball team at latin school in chicago And there was um, a game against Francis Parker, the school that he was previously at. So there's been a lot of um, hostile um, back and forth between the teams, uh, not in a good way in terms of, you know, their their sportsmanship. 
And so the night of the game, uh, the Latin School of Chicago was losing. And um, there was a post that was put on Instagram implying that Latin was losing. And um, my son took the hit for it. And like in a mob mentality started to attack him um, on, a, on a basketball text thread. They were insulting him. They were threatening him. Oh, they were wow. humiliating him. Um, and then that same weekend, a Snapchat message was created by a student um, with threatening messages. And as he posted it, other students started picking up the Snapchat message and adding expletives and messaging that implied physical harm and deadly harm. And one of the pieces on there that till this day still just shakes me to my core and the, and the way that my son interpreted it was an emoji that meant to smoking his ashes. Uh, and in addition to that, we um, do know that he received a separate Snapchat, Snapchat message telling him to go kill himself. So the culmination of all this severe cyberbullying spun out of control. Uh, he did w report the cyberbullying to the Dean of Students that weekend via email, and he attached a copy of the Snapchat to the email. Uh, so it clearly identified three students who were a part of the cyberbullying, and he had asked the Dean of Students mm -hmm. for help to make it stop and had referred to it as cyberbullying. What is most... And did he so get a, a response? So a few days later, um, what is most disturbing to us is that when the Dean of Students was trying to close the loop on the issue, she responded to him in the email and minimized his report of cyberbullying by referencing it as social media behaviors. Well, well but... but 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 oh, I want to wow. point out that so, so he went to the dean of students, desperate for her help, and she actually met with him the following day. And just so you know, I mean, common sense and prudence, but also Illinois law required her to immediately uh, begin an investigation and to inform the parents of both the victim and the bullies. Okay, which she did not tell us, and and. We later, many, many, uh, well over a year later, uh, through litigation, we ended up, uh, because we we're suing the school for wrongful death, among other things, but through litigation, we actually were able to get our hands on the handwritten notes of that meeting. And at the very top of her notes are the words in bold and circled with asterisks on both sides, no parents, no parents. And yeah, uh, right. we don't, we, I mean, uh, I, it, there, they, it has been telegraphed to us that our son said to the dean, please do not tell my parents, which is why this goes back. Okay, well, this is a, a, a perfect example of when you have a child who is in danger. You, I mean, does the child really have the, the like I said, the consequences, the understanding that my parents shouldn't be involved in the, the, the fact that the administrators would go, oh, we were told by a 15 year old he's thinking of suicide, but we should keep that from his mom and dad. That's insane. It is insane. And 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 um, <laughs> so it is insane. And it's also against the law in Illinois, um, period, end of story. But it is insane, and and as as my wife pointed out, when our son wasn't covering his nose and mouth with his mask, they informed us. When he was tardy or missed school, they informed us. You, every other little thing, they informed us. But when he came to them with this incredibly serious thing, and 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 I don't want to get too much into details, just because again, like I said, it's a subject of litigation. But I know I can tell you this, which is just mind boggling. The dean actually wrote our son an email, which sounded like it was scripted by a lawyer several days later. And it said, per your advice, I won't be contacting your parents. I mean, first of all, a 15 year old isn't obviously in a position to advise the school, but who even talks that way to a child per your advice? Right. It's amazing. And so we, I, I, the fact that, that, that his, he made a report, these kids are told, go to a trusted adult. When you feel like you're in danger, 
go to a trusted adult to report something when you need help. And he followed the school's protocols. And he said, I'm here because I need help. And she goes and diminutizes his request for help and, 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 and essentially blamed it on him because she said she wrote back to him, next time you post, you should pause. So his report was diminutized. He was already feeling helpless and hopeless, and he was, he was blamed. So he felt like he had nowhere to go. And what was even more disturbing is after he reported the incident and had a meeting with her, he then was cyberbullied again a couple hours later on a, the text message thread. And then um, later that night, uh, we know now after having his electronics um, reviewed, we now know that later that night he was researching suicide. And, and, and just so you know, so we didn't know any of this. Ever, I, I don't think I don't think we ever would have found out because the school had no intention, apparently, of telling us what happened. Is um, uh, that was in mid to late December of 2021, and he died on January 13th. And um, we now know, just through our litigation, the school immediately went into kind of a crisis management mode of scrambling around and, and cover our own butts. And 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 anyhow. A mother of one of the students who was on the text thread who didn't who didn't participate just saw it all. The student went to the mother, and the mother demanded a meeting with the school and showed it all to them. And they promised to look into it. She didn't know that they already had seen it and knew, but in any event, she demanded that they look into it and do an investigation. And I think after about eleven or twelve or thirteen days of that clearly doing nothing. She finally reached out to us. We didn't know where. We actually found out about it oh, wow. five, six weeks after it happened and two weeks after his death from a from another parent. So when he died, did you understand? I mean, were you just left wondering we had, how we had no idea. this happened? Is that, we had no idea. We were completely in the dark. We were so blindsided. We 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 hadn't we were just shocked, absolutely shocked. We had no idea where this would had come from. And in addition to that, we had already made all the arrangements to have him transfer back to Francis Parker hmm. uh, because things had gotten so bad for him at Latin. Uh, we were able to get him transferred, and he was supposed to start back at Francis Parker on January 24th. So in our minds, we thought we had diffused everything. He was going to be okay, and he was going to go back to his previous school, and we were going to start fresh and start from scratch. We've had all these initiatives on bullying, and it seems like uh, again, I'll say I think that none of us who grew up without this technology can fully understand the extent to which kids can torture each other on social media. And I've seen it with my own daughter. She was showing me last night one of the kids in her classroom who was putting stuff, videos of themselves out on some one of these social media apps and the comments of other kids just ripping this little person. And I'm like, oh my word, how is this? How do you take this? I mean, I couldn't take that. It's tough. I don't read the comments on my social media now. And that's because I know not to, you know, but I think if I were a kid and I were constantly being just crushed with all of these comments and, and then one of my um, friends, she said that last year her son was in school in eighth grade and so close to all of his friends. And then one day the friends said, you're not a part of our group. They would actually stand and tell him you're not welcome over here. He spent the last semester of eighth grade being completely alone. And the parents didn't know how to handle it, really genuinely felt at a complete loss. But I know you've created buckets over bullying. So from your experience, what can you tell other parents who are really at a loss for what to do when this is happening with their kid? Or even if they don't know, what could they, what are the signs that they can say, hey, I need to step in or I need to talk to the teachers? Well, right there is one of the problems because I'm sure you've seen and heard this as well. There, there's this is a multi-layer problem. We've got school administrators mm -hmm. who are not taking bullying and cyberbullying seriously. We have parents on both sides, parents who are, children are being victimized by bullying, and uh, the children who are doing the bullying. So, as a parent like myself who's experienced um, my child being victimized. 
and going to the administrators. There are many cases where you go to the school and the school will uh, deny, deflect, or gaslight you and say to you, this is not bullying, this is not cyberbullying, right? They won't, they won't listen to you. Or they'll say, we don't, ha- uh, th- we don't have documented ev- evidence to do anything. Uh, in that situation, if that's the case and you feel like your child is in danger, at this point, until this mess is straightened out, and when I have parents call me to ask me what to do, this point I say, get a lawyer. Until, mm-hmm. un- until, until schools start to take every incident of bullying and cyberbullying seriously, and it should be because it's become so dangerous, uh, it should not be subjective anymore because it's, it's, it's putting our, 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 our it's, it's, it's leading to devastating consequences in some cases. Why are schools not stepping in? I mean, we hear this about students that ended up becoming depressed and then hurting someone else, students who became depressed and hurt themselves. But, but the common theme here seems to be that schools are not stepping in. And there's also this don't tell the parents. I mean, I, I honestly just experienced this last night where I go to school, find my daughter crumpled in the girl's bathroom crying hysterically. I say, what happened? And she says, I was pulled aside and I was told by my teacher that he reviewed my homework and believes that I cheated and that I was getting a zero and that I would have to come home and face the music with you. But I didn't get a call from the teacher. Nobody reached out to me. And I feel like you you put my kid in a position where her whole world crumbled down and you didn't tell me that this happened. Why is this that Teachers and administrators are almost feeling empowered to let kids suffer and then not say it. And then they feel like parents don't deserve to know. That's a great question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. And we're seeing it everywhere, just like in your example and when it pertains to when kids are in danger. Um, I mean, we, we also saw an instance where a child was being physically beaten in school and the kids recorded it and posted it on social media. And the adults in the room don't do anything. They don't, they don't reprimand the kids. They don't call in the parents. They don't demand apologies. I don't know what's happened in the school systems, both public and private, where parents aren't notified when, when their kid is, is in danger, whether it's mentally or physically. And at this point, really the only thing that as parents to, to gain control and to gain our rights back, is is to start to get legal support, um, unfortunately. And what I also hope is that parents don't wait until something devastating happens to get legal support. Um, when I have parents call me when they're in the midst of a crisis, when their child is in the midst of being bullying, I say right away, call the police, get a lawyer, ask for a protective order before things get worse. But then what happens too, what we were referring to in a minute ago um then the child will say it's you're going to make it worse right don't call the school don't call Exa- don't yes. call the yes. parent because you're going to make it worse for me and that happened in our case as well my son during that semester was coming home from school and sharing with me the digs that he was getting day after day after day in here so upset so enraged telling me who was doing it how it happened and so I called the parent next door of the child who was doing this to my son. I gave that parent notice two times. I said, your son is hurting my son. Can we please do something about this? It needs to stop. My son is very upset. And then at the end of the conversation, I said, but please don't. I don't want my son to find out that I called you because he's, it's going to further upset him. And what happened? Very next day, my son comes home from school. He's very angry with me because he's getting teased and made fun of at lunch because I'm the mom calling the parent of the child to, you know, say, stop upsetting my son. So we're like on this vicious cycle. And so what's, what's happening is parents, the parent community, we're not banding together to protect our children together, whether it's a parent of the child being bullied or the, or the child who is being unkind to the other child. Parents have to be open minded and listen and receive that information and be respectful to the parent who's making the call saying, I need your help. Your child is hurting my child. That's not happening. We need to shift society. Parents need to shift their perspective and say, this, this affects all of us, right? 
because sometimes a child is doing that's what i say about even seeing adults these days go after each other like where did how did society get to this point where we think it's okay to say things that you wouldn't say in person you wouldn't sit down and and just say this to someone you are friends with but these you've got people that are just going after each other and i think that kids are learning from this i mean kids have access to everything whether we like it or not i i know people say oh i have all these protections on social media there is no way to know what they can get access to they can do things that you have no idea and and i you know i know all of the stories of don't let them have media social media don't let them have phones don't let them have devices i mean this is the world in which we live it is impossible to say that we are not going to be in living in this world. And so I think a lot of parents today feel like we're in a, a very ugly world. I, I just think it's fascinating to me. I did not know about the law in Illinois. I think that's fascinating to me because we have been conditioned by, I would say, even bullied by some folks into saying kids get to make choices without parents. Parents should not be involved. And there are a lot of parents, I, even in my, my sister's school where her daughter goes, she said, I spoke up one time and the parents were like, oh my, you have to let the kids make their own choices. You can't have a voice here. We've been conditioned to believe that these are a, a little adults running around and they don't need us anymore. Well, that's that's not what the law says either. So I, I think it's fascinating to me that that's the law in Illinois, but it's also fascinating to me that you say, get a lawyer, get an attorney, because I think it's something you're right, that innate feeling of, I don't want to embarrass my own kid. I don't want to make this worse. But but then you, this is as this is as bad as it can get. So this is as bad as it can get. And what I've also and and what's so, so frustrating, but I hope that this is a wake up call to schools across the country, administrators across the country, both private and public, is because I've been following it. In this year alone, 2023, there have been five settlements for um, loss of life of children who have been bullied in schools across the country, um, which is so, so disturbing. It's seven and eight figures, not yeah. small so, settlement. Um, and I actually, wow. I, I wanted to, I, I, because I want parents to know, I actually brought it with me. Um, just recently, a child by the name of Diego Stoltz in California, he was physically attacked um, in school. He was punched in the head. Um, he fell over and the injury caused um, caused loss of life. They were awarded $27 million. Again, not for the settlement. Not that there's no price tag on a child and the family is not, it's not going to change the, the, the hell that the family is going through. But my point being is that schools need to do a much better job of protecting our children. And this is the story that I read. This child was relentlessly bullied over and over again. This, just, the parents reported it. They did everything they can and the school turned a blind eye. Same thing happened. Mallory Grossman in New Jersey. She was bullied online and offline relentlessly for over a year when, uh, when she was in sixth grade. Her parents reported it. She reported it. They did. It's exactly our story, just a, a different family. She was 12 years old and she took her own life because she couldn't handle it. Oh. This is the, it took five years, but the, the Grossman family was awarded a settlement of nine million dollars. Again, not the money, but it's, it's, in, it's the point that at some point, parents have to start to hold schools accountable in their feet to the fire that our children deserve an environment, a safe environment to go to school. If this happened in the workplace among adults, this would not be tolerated. This is all illegal criminal behavior. And in our in our case, we've been very, very um, vocal about the fact that to the extent that ultimately there's any financial recovery, we, we plan to donate the entire to that. I mean, we're obviously very, very involved in all sorts of advocacy through our nonprofit, but we intend to to donate every penny because again, it's not about that. But on the other end, but although we feel strongly that we could uh, take what is a rightful uh, settlement and put it to much better use, but, but that's not, but that's only part of the point. The point is, as my wife was saying, is that unfortunately, the only way that the schools are going to treat this with the seriousness that it needs to be treated is when districts are paying nine million and twenty seven million and on and on yes. and on. I mean, we give our kids consequences. This is this is what we're asking. We want them to feel the consequences of not taking action, of not being involved. And and I think it goes all the way back to training teachers. When you have teachers who then 
generally are the ones who become administrators. These are things that I certainly hope our universities are looking at what the challenges are with cyberbullying and bullying in general. And I think this has to be, we're so focused on other trainings right now, but we're talking about children's lives and gen genuinely talking about life and death situations here. And I think your point is so valid that they have to feel these consequences, whether it is a private or a public school, has to understand that there is, it, our children's lives are priceless. Let's be honest, our children's lives are priceless. But you have to understand that there is a price to pay when you decide to look the other way, when a child's life is on the line, or when you decide to say, oh, this kid is mature enough to tell me his parents don't need to be involved. I think that's really the issue that we're getting at here today. Mom and dad are mom and dad. If this kid has a house, whether it's mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or aunt and uncle who take care of them, those people are the ones that that love that child more than anyone else. They they will take care of their own child, but you have to tell them. Parents should not be denied the right to protect their child, especially in this environment now where bullying and cyberbullying has become so dangerous and has led to deadly consequences. It is not. It is not a judgment call anymore on the side of an administrator to decide whether or not that um, an incident or a report um, is at their discretion whether they notify a parent or not. It is. Uh, it is. The, if if Rob and I would have had the opportunity to intervene, if we had been notified that day, if at if at three thirty that afternoon the dean called us and said your son came in today to report an incident of cyberbullying. We need you to come in. We need to talk about it. We're calling in the parents. I can attest to you that our son would be here today because we would have known, right? And all we would have known, and we would have had the opportunity to intervene, and put put support systems in place, and to protect him from any further harm. But we 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 had no clue. So how we didn't even have the opportunity to do so. And, and I want to point out, well, first of all, the 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 law which has existed for some amount of time used to require that schools inform parents. It was a little vague, but people interpreted it as 10 days. We were very fortunate to have worked with some members of the Illinois General Assembly a few months ago to actually have that law changed to now require a 24-hour notice, which which is, yeah, which oh, is wow, appropriate. Thank you. Which is appropriate, the, the speed at which things move online. But I also wanted to point out, and I know I said this before, but but I want to I want to stress it again. It's not only the parents of the victim who uh, it's mandated to be informed. It's also the parents of the bully. And, 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 and I, I, I can, I can, mm -hmm. I, I will add to what my wife said. I think that not only had we been informed, we could have remedied the situation. It's probably fair to say that had the parents of the bullies been informed, that would have further helped remedy the situation. And, and I would tell you, like, I can't get into the heads of some of these parents of, of the bullies but you know what could have been a learning experience for a bunch of 15 and 16 year old boys has now turned into something that even these bullies are going to have to sort of live with and think about for the rest of their lives so their own parents were 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 had taken from them the opportunity to intervene and help because again the school completely abused what it thought was discretion right absolutely and those are very hard things to live with for as long as those kids will have to deal with that the rest of their lives. And for you, it's the rest of your life that you're dealing with this. And I just have to say, when I see parents like you who have gone through such tragedy and you immediately say, we are going to do something and changing the law, but even creating your organization, I'm just in awe of your ability to do this. And you, you, uh, you have done such great work. Can you tell our audience one more time about your organization, just how they can help? Because I know, I mean, we talk to people all the time and they are, these are top of mind concerns. These are the real life concerns. We talk about them a lot, but these are the real life concerns. So how can they find you guys? Sure. Um, our organization is Buckets Over Bullying. Our website is bucketsoverbullying.org. Our our primary goal is the following is education. Uh, parents need to start to educate themselves on how dangerous social media has become to our children. They can't start, they can't keep handing cell phones to their kids with access to social media without rules, without um, boundaries, without explaining to them what are the do's and don'ts. 
Um, and we're working with an organization out of California, the Organization for Social Media Safety, uh, where we bring in their curriculum into schools in Illinois to educate mm-hmm. kids on the harms of social media, how to protect themselves and what to do when they're in danger, and parents as well. Um, ideally, we would love to roll that curriculum out across the country. Like you said before, there needs to be cyber safety education in every school across the country, and it should be mandated. Um, yeah, the other, the other, it, 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 just like any other topic that you know has, has now become mandated, cyberbullying and bullying needs to be in there. Um, the other thing that we work on as well is advocacy. So uh, we work really hard to support uh, federal legislation that's been introduced to put protections in place for our kids as well as state legislation here in Illinois. Um, the one thing that I do want to highlight to the peer community that's something that we should all start to think about and to demand this is I believe now that Bullying and cyberbullying should fall under mandated reporting laws. Bullying and cyberbullying mm, is a form of an, yeah. is is a form of abuse, right? So, if every teacher and faculty and administrator is quote unquote a mandated reporter by law and they're required to report um, to child and family services if they see a child who shows signs of abuse and neglect, bullying and cyberbullying needs to be pulled into that into that trigger as well. It could it it could potentially be life-saving. And then what would happen is it would not be subjective anymore, right? Right. Um, So I just wanted to put that out there because I keep trying to think of ways like how do we get our arms around this and how do we put more safeguards around our children to make sure that we don't have any more horrific tragedies that we've experienced. And then finally, the third uh, focus of our organization is legal action. Um, My parents have called me desperate saying, you know, telling me their story and they don't know what to do. And I say, you know what, at this point, your best option is getting legal counsel. But what happens is um, the immediate reaction is, well, how am I going to afford an attorney, right? A parent is going to recoil because lawyers fees are so exorbitant. So that has become a huge barrier and giving parents their rights back to try to find ways to protect their children. And so here in Illinois... Um, we've partnered with um, a law firm who is offering pro bono legal services when families are in crisis. And removing that barrier, then at least parents have a resource to go to when they've already called the school, reached out to the parents of the bullies. The child is saying, please don't do anything else because you're making it worse for me. And the child is refusing to go to school. You, as a parent, you need help. You you, you need help. And there's yeah. no other way. So. Ideally, what I'd like to do moving forward, and we're working on it, is to build a network of attorneys across the country who are all interconnected, Mm -hmm. have a representative in each state that would offer pro bono legal services to families who are in crisis when they feel that their child is not safe at school. Removing that barrier would give us all the power, more power back to, to peers to protect our children. I love that. That is amazing. And like I said, you are both incredible. We are in awe of what you've been able to do. Thank you so much for being here, Rob and Rose Bronstein. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining us once again on the Tudor Dixon podcast for this episode and others head over to TudorDixonPodcast.com. You can subscribe right there or check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts and join us next time on the Tudor Dixon podcast. Have a blessed day.